In all my years playing video games, I had to suffer through the same questions multiple times. Why are you still playing? Shouldn't you be spending your time in a more productive way? Why are you taking that knife? And what is this XXX prawn folder in your Skyrim installation files? I'm so sick of it. What's so hard to understand? What other kind of media allows you to vent your daily frustrations the way games do? We've all been stuck in the traffic in the morning, so why not blow up some cars in GTA to relieve the tension? And we've all had to deal with a little girl named Veronica in middle school bullying us relentlessly and making us miserable until you got past puberty, right? So take that, you absolute bit! It is what we call a power fantasy. Yet I struggle to find games nowadays that help me relieve that feeling, which seems strange since there's been an overload of games that give you any kind of superpower you can think of. So the question I had to ask myself was, why do I feel powerful when playing Doom, but I can't say the same when I play, I don't know, Wolfenstein The New Order? Both games feature a larger-than-life protagonist, both games task us with saving humanity, and in both games you kill hordes of demons. So where's the difference? I did what every good investigator would do when the case at hand is not the sudden death of a high-profile man with lots of ties with powerful people. Gosh. I dove in and started from the beginning. As far as game design's basics go, the difficulty curve should follow pretty much a linear flow, striking a balance between how hard the enemies can kick our asses and how proficiently we can deal with them. At the beginning you suck, therefore the obstacles should also kind of suck. As long as the game follows this path, you can create a sense of challenge. And for those of you who may not be familiar with this concept, I suggest you play other games aside from Assassin's Creed. Power fantasies work differently, though. The whole idea is that the player should typically be stronger and able to waste opponents with ease, therefore the difficulty becomes less of a line and more of a curve that goes in our favor. The sexiest and most thrilling curve you could ever ride. I like to refer to it as the awesomeness curve, which dictates that at every given moment the player has the edge. But now we're stuck with quite the problem, because where's the challenge if I'm constantly more powerful than my opponents? The AAA industry has solved this for us by just not giving a shit. Plenty of games out there make you constantly so overpowered the only way they can put a stop to your massacre is if they create a difficulty spike out of nowhere, which ends up being the worst of both worlds. But at this point I had to remind myself that, wait, Doom was pretty hard, and Doom Eternal even more. Challenging games, yet they still felt like a power fantasy. Come to think of it, Call of Duty has made me kill platoons of enemy soldiers on a yearly basis. So technically, that should also qualify as a power fantasy? Could I have been wrong all along? Of course not, I'm never wrong. I was just looking at it from the wrong perspective. I thought that the awesomeness curve influenced the gameplay, and it does in part, but what it really deals with are our disgusting, squishy feelings. It's a narrative tool. Let's take a look at Devil May Cry 3 and Ninja Gaiden Sigma, two games that have sent players either to the ER with broken bones or to therapy to treat their PTSD. Hard games with very little room for mistakes. So why do I feel like I'm making my enemies weep in Devil May Cry 3, but I can't say the same about Ninja Gaiden Sigma? Because the narrative supports it. At the start of the game, Dante gets impaled and he doesn't give a fuck. That's how you check if someone's truly cool, and that's how I've been picking my friends since high school. Right after that, he serves on top of demons and eats pizza because he's a good guy. When I start playing, there's a dude off screen telling me I'm dope and Dante keeps taunting his enemies. I'm feeling proper cool because the game is reinforcing that notion to me. If I end up dying, the illusion isn't broken because rather than feeling like Dante is weak and defeated, in my mind there's just the thought that he's looking at me from heaven with disdain because he would have done a much better job if I wasn't so pathetic. Remember when I compared Doom to Wolfenstein? Well, now it should be easy to understand why I consider the formula power fantasy. You wake up as Cyber Jesus, you smash demons' heads, and even other humans are terrified by your sexiness. In Wolfenstein, PJ Blazkowicz might be the greatest soldier in all of America, but he's still very human. He loses people, he has to sneak in behind enemy lines, he disguises himself as a Nazi because he can't realistically go gun blazing all the time. He is strong, but not invincible. The Doomslayer, however, is a one-man army who needs no help from allies and never outright loses a battle. At best, enemies run away from him before he can get his hands on them. 
But there is one element from New Order that we can use to our advantage when dealing with the awesomeness curve. The prologue. We attack a Nazi base, but we fail miserably. One of our friends is turned into Nazi Robocop, and we also end up in a coma. That's something only a post office worker would consider a power fantasy. But it's the perfect way to set up the subsequent carnage. By making the player see firsthand how much more powerful the enemies are in the prologue, you get an even greater sense of satisfaction when you get your retribution. It's the precipice. When you are powerless and defeated, only to rise back afterwards with new tools in your arsenal that make the opponents a paltry bunch of morons. God of War has been using this as a narrative tool so many times that Kratos must have started collecting stamps on his afterlife loyalty card. Next time I get a free Sunday! Kratos dies more times than I can count, but when he comes back, he starts eliminating everything in his path with ease. Which technically means that his superpower is being pissed off to death. In contrast, what happened in God of War Valhalla, the free DLC for God of War Ragnarok, breaks the illusion of a power fantasy. In the weirdest therapy session of all time, Kratos tries to overcome the challenges of Valhalla by dying and retrying until he's finally big boy enough to succeed. Sheesh, I once said that violence is the best therapy, but now we're getting silly. But what this means is that Kratos is canonically being punched left and right for the entire duration of the story until he's finally strong-willed enough to reach the end of the gauntlet. This is the polar opposite of the awesomeness curve, it's the nefarious curve. Think of our games or Dark Souls, they lay there. Your character is designed around the idea that they are weaker than the opponents, and every victory is obtained through blood and sweat, and you can't really sell the illusion of power if you're showing the character being defeated every 5 minutes. What you can do, though, is adding a weakness. Superman might be the strongest and most boring dude in the universe, but a trip to Tiffany could be fatal if they take out a kryptonite gem. But on top of my mind, I can't really recall many games where this was used in the context of a power fantasy. I can definitely think of plenty of games on the nefarious curve doing this, like Descent in Meter in Amnesia Dark Descent, but that's about it. And it's baffling to me, since it would be the best way to preserve the integrity of the curve while also balancing the difficulty. Sure, you could be able to annihilate a whole platoon of soldiers with your bare hands, but if your weakness was, I don't know, beautiful women breasts, now those soldiers could just hide in Amsterdam's red light district, and you'd need to avoid all the half-naked girls on display. I wouldn't feel less powerful compared to my foes because they're just as weak as before, it's just that now they're attempting to save their digital asses and I need to plan ahead appropriately. You could have the character carry a picture of Queen Elizabeth with him and use it to cover the screen to avoid the sight of those terrible, destabilizing boobies. Alright, you already know how this video is going to end, it's the part where I pull out a game that somehow fits all my made up roles, but let's play it out anyway, shall we? <clears throat> oh, Robin up, you insufferable prick! Surely there can't be a game out there that satisfies all your made up rules, you're just complaining for the sake of it because you're lonely, bitter, and eternally unsatisfied. Well, shit, only one of those things isn't true. Yes, there is a game that manages to follow to a T all I described so far, one that might have not aged gracefully but that has been on my mind ever since the first time I played the demo ages ago on my PS3. I'm talking of... In this game we play as a 50 year old chain smoker in the body of a 20 years old mafia dude, Jackie Estacado, and on the night of his birthday he discovers that the candles he's supposed to blow off are sitting on top of a bomb rather than a cake. He survives, but now he's hunted by his uncle's goons, and a couple of shots are more than enough to put him down. He's cornered, he's alone, there's nothing he can do to survive. Through you, I am born. That's when the power of the darkness turns him into this Lovecraftian monster able to turn enemies into tasty kebabs. Quite literally. It's brutal, it's gory, it's awesome. There's a reason if a common way to describe this game was it's a horror where you are the monster. Enemies scream in fear when you transform, they hide behind doors but you can't just send out your big sausage to eat their face. Actually, why even bother doing anything? Just summon one of your rat goblins from underground and send them to do your bidding. Ok, you can't do that because the AI barely worked, but the idea was solid, ok? Nothing in this game is able to defeat you. The only person who ever manages to survive your attack does so because he runs away and later on because he figures out, you guessed it, your weakness. Care to guess what that might be? Beautiful women breath. It's light. 
of course it's light. And what's really cool is how the powers you obtain also help destroying lights with more ease. You can look like a moron shooting every street lamp because you're afraid of mods or something, or you can just do this. No, no, no. That's still lame as hell. How about a giant black hole that also sucks in those policemen along for the ride? The entire plot is about power fantasies. On one hand, you're on the path of vengeance to kill your bastard uncle, but on the other, the darkness itself is attempting to control your soul. It prevents you from saving your girlfriend, it belittles you to no end, it's evil and malevolent, so Jackie has to find a way to gain control over it. And you know, it's one thing to have the edge over some mafia goons, but it's incredibly more epic to see your character also overpowering some kind of evil god. The darkness promises you freedom from your earthly shackles, but when you see past its lies and ultimately defeated, you can take pride at listening to it crying like a bitch, telling you you won't get away with it, oh yeah, it's gonna come back and show you. Satisfying stuff. I should add it to the awesomeness curve, I might call it the Todd Howard. <laughs>